Oh, I can hear you, yeah. I think we're good now. Uh, good morning, community. How are you? Okay. Two of you are doing really well. That's great. Um, my name is Adam Clark. I'm one of the worship leaders here. I'm really excited to uh, lead worship with you today. Uh, found out when I got here that I might be dressed a little too provocative with my shorts on, so I apologize if that is just too much leg right now. Um, yeah, not at all. Anyways, um, if you could stand, I'm going to we're going to teach you a new song today. Uh, I'm going to start off showing you a uh, the bridge from it so that you know some part of it. Um, I'm going to pray real quick. Father God, we just invite you into this place. We invite you into our hearts and our minds. And whatever this is, God, it's our offering to you. And we want to take this time to give you our all. Um, I just pray a blessing over this room, um, a blessing over uh, each person and family represented here, and we hope that you feel honored and praised in this. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. So the bridge is ring, king, when bloom, my house was built on you, and I'm safe with you, I'm going to make it through. All right, now you all sing it. All right. Rain came when bloom. My house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. All right, good. Good, good, good. So I think as... I'm the man of my house a lot when my wife allows me to be, but I think it's important for our house to be grounded in Christ. I mean, there's no, nothing more important than that. And this song kind of hits it home with me a couple times, just where um, if I'm trying to complete stuff on my own or if I'm allowing God to intervene and allowing uh, me trusting his will for uh, that part of my life. So this is a firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I've built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't You won't fail. You won't fail. You won't. You won't. You won't fail. You won't fail. 
cross was built on you. And I'm safe with you. I'm going to make it through. Sing it out, church. Drink. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou
be seated. I only have a couple of announcements today, and that's because we're going to do something a little bit different, but I'll explain what that is here in a second. My first announcement is we have a summer series starting in the month of August on the 13th, the 20th, and the 27th at 6 p.m. We're going to cover a, a few different topics from marriage, marriage, parenting, and evangelism. These will be in the evening, so you'll be welcome to come back. If you have kids, we would love for you to attend. We just need to know that you're planning on bringing those kids, and you can do that by signing up so we can make sure we have enough child care so that you can come, you can be enriched and enjoy the time learning about these topics and how uh, the Bible approaches those topics. So we would love for you to be a part of that and join us for that. The only other announcement I have today is if you would like to uh, worship today through giving, you can do that through the boxes that are located by our entrances, or you can do that online through the Church Center app. Now to the part that's going to be a little bit different. All right, We have a missions team that is going to Kalamazoo, to the Kalamazoo Gospel Ministries. It's a, a mission up in Kalamazoo. There are 10 teenagers going and three adults that are going to be attempting to wrangle them all week long. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to run a VBS for their kids program. We're going to be uh, working in their food kitchen. And uh, the, the guy said, I have some other projects lined up for you. I don't know what that means, but we're excited to go and do that. Uh, but we're going to be going from today at 4 on through uh, Friday. We'll be back Friday evening sometime. So some of you came to our spaghetti dinner we had the other night, and I did announce that we raised over $1,000 there, and all of our kids are paid for and easily going on this trip. Yeah, that's very exciting. All right. We actually had a little bit of extra money so that we were able to get the kids a few snacks on the trip, too. Uh, but we are very thankful for that support, and I want to send our team the right way on this trip. So what we're going to do is the folks that are sitting either in front of you or behind you or beside you, I'd like you to spend a little bit of time praying with them. All right, so I know this is a little bit different. Normally I close this in prayer and then we go back to singing. We're, uh, we're skipping one song today and we're going to spend some time kind of corporately praying and sending off our missions team. So what that'll look like is we have a few different prayer requests up here if you don't know what exactly to pray for for them. But basically, I just want you to lift up our team and pray that God will use them this week, both in the lives of the people there, but also that they will grow, including myself personally, through this trip. So if we could take the next like three-ish minutes and just pray out loud with each other, you're just going to turn to a few folks around you and pray, and then I'll close us in prayer and we'll sing one last song before Tyler comes up. All right, go ahead.
God, I, uh, I just want to lift up our team as we we leave this afternoon to go and we are uh, attempting to serve you. I pray for opportunities to spread your love, um, and I pray for the, the courage to, to do that without fear. Um, I pray for the teams as they go that you stretch them, and I pray for the leaders that you give us wisdom, but ultimately that you also grow us. Um, and I pray that we are a blessing to the staff at the mission and to the, the folks who are there as a uh, part of their lives. I pray this in your name. Amen. Please stand, and we got one more song to sing.
Amen. Before I invite Tyler up here, if you are in third to fifth grade, you can head that way to the gym. And if you are in any other grade below that, you can go that way to your classroom. All right, I'm going to go ahead and invite Tyler up. He's going to introduce himself. Good morning, Community Church. How are we doing? Good. All right. Hey, uh, I want you to open up to Hebrews chapter 10. I'll give you a few minutes to hang out there uh, toward the end of your Bible. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews is my favorite book of the Bible, and Hebrews chapter 10 is my favorite chapter, um, and uh, it's because of the earlier stuff. What I'm going to preach today is 19 through 25, so if you want to find your place there. Um, I come to you from Gospel City Church close by down in Granger. Um, Dan is a good friend, is becoming a good friend. We live in the same neighborhood now, so I see him and his wife walking their dog, and uh, uh, happy to be here with you today and encourage you with the word. It's an honor. Um, to handle the word with you today. So, and, and so it's just been a great meeting. Some of you, I'm at Crest in the back, and Josh, I'm excited to see folks go on mission. I think um, it's just so important. Uh, you know, I, I don't know of a single missionary overseas that didn't catch the flame of mission starting on a, on a, a quick little week trip. Um, that's how it starts, right? And so uh, my prayer is that they would just be bold and that there would be folks who would hear the gospel because they're going to Kalamazoo. So I'm excited to be with you. I am much like Adam. I spend the majority of my week in flip-flops when able. Um, and so I didn't know that was part of the dress code today. Um, you'll ask, you can ask my, I, I, I even have that nickname on staff at our church, flip-flop, because they can hear me coming down the hall throughout the week. I can't make that sound. So Hebrews 10, um, a couple of weeks ago, back in May, uh, my family and I got to go on vacation. We kind of hacked the system a little bit. Um, we went right after the I Learn testing in Indiana, but before school completely ends. And you know those last two weeks of school. I mean, there's not much going on that's just extremely educational in, in focus, right? So there's the I Learn testing, and then we peeled out for a week. We didn't have the perfect attendance. That's not, we just don't care about that. Um, <laughs> We, we're all about like cheaper flights and less people wherever we go, right? So we got to get out of town. Before that time, for about the two months prior to that trip, there was just a more focus on the coming of the vacation, right? So everything that's happening in life can be thought of in light of, it's okay, we're going to get away for a week here soon, right? Why is it snowing in April? It's okay, we're heading down south soon, um, that's a good thing. That, that day is approaching. That, that moment where we head to the airport and get on a flight is coming. And you can kind of um, place everything that's going on in your life in light of the coming day. And that's an exciting thing. There's another scenario that some of you have probably experienced um, where that day coming isn't such a great day, but a hard day. Um, maybe a, a hard phone call and some news that, that things are different health-wise or whatever. And all of a sudden, what comes into focus is the clarity of things that actually matter. So I'm from Texas, from Fort Worth, so I'm a big Cowboys fan. I can't help it. I've just tried to root for teams around here, and I just don't care. I just, I'm just like, it's the Colts. Who cares? Uh, now, Green Bay, I root passionately against them. I know, I just lost all of you. I can't, hopefully, you know, we can unify under the gospel this morning, okay? Um, because I'm a Cowboy fan, and they have been beating us uh, left and right the last, like, 15, 20, 30 years. So, uh, Cowboy fan, and my youth pastor is a big Cowboy fan, and I remember his mom passed away. The Cowboys were in the middle of a playoff run. And when I say in the middle, they hadn't played their first game yet, because after that, they're done. And uh, so, so that game was approaching, and his mom passed away, and we talked about it, and he said, you know what? It just kind of clarifies how little... Football playoffs matter. They just don't, they just don't matter. Um, the clarity that comes in a moment uh, is, is very helpful for us. And I want to bring you that today from Hebrews 10. Um, if you look in your, your Bibles about verse, uh, well, let's, yeah, 25. So I'm going to read 24 and 25 to give a little bit of context to start us out. It says, let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. How many of you have that day capitalized? 
couple of you, some of you, yeah, okay. So what's, what's being referenced here, that day is something very specific. It's not just next Tuesday. It's the return of the Lord Jesus. That's the day that's approaching. And there is a way that you and I are supposed to live in light of the coming of that day. And I'm going to just caution uh, the room this morning. I'm going to invite a little bit of response. I don't know if that's normal here. Uh, I'm going to invite that. I'm going to ask you to throw up a hand in a second. Um, but, but I'm going to be willing to bet that not all of us throughout the week live in light of that day. We get distracted. We get caught up in other things, good things, just not eternal things, right? So I want to just remind us of the importance of that this morning. So Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, I got to get everything organized up here. Um, I love the table. Just don't have enough room. I got a clicker this morning. Could I have used the clicker earlier during the music? And just controlled that? That feels like a lot of power. Okay, they said no. No, we don't give you that kind of power. Um, praise the Lord. Um, so that day is coming. Days are numbered. Jesus is coming back. And my goal is to w- awaken within you, if it's not there already, to awaken within you a desire to belong to this community that's around you. You don't just go to church once a week. You belong to the people. That's what the church is, right? And it is a people gathered locally, So there is a local component to what it means to be the church. But if you think of it in terms of we're just going to go for an hour and then leave and the the Bible's going to hang out on the shelf the rest of the week, I want to invite you into something deeper because the day is approaching. So 10, 19 through 25, I'm going to read it all and then we'll talk about it. So it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus... He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Your version might say to stir up or to spur on. That word is a strong word there. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. That habit of neglecting the church, it's unfortunate that it can become a habit, but it can, right? It just becomes a habit. And man, during COVID, it became a habit and some people didn't come back. Church, attending church, doing life with each other should be so habitual that you just, your kids don't even ask on Sunday morning if you're going to make it to church that morning, right? So there is a habit that I want us to develop and grow in and, and, and sink our teeth deeper into, okay? So 19 through 22 reminded us of the gospel of Jesus, that there was a curtain bigger than the one behind me, taller, different colors, heavier, that separated the most holy place from the holy place, from the places uh, where the courts of the Jews and the Gentiles could go. So temple, Jerusalem, uh, you know, 20 AD, when Jesus is walking and preaching and teaching, there's a temple. And this temple had different stops along the way and places you could and could not go. So if you were to get in a time machine with me and we were to travel back, we would approach that temple and there would be a man at the gate and he would be saying, Jew, Gentile, Gentile, cool, you can go right here but no further. There's a do not enter sign after the Gentile court, the court of the Gentiles. And then maybe you're like, no, 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 I'm a Jew. These guys are Gentiles. I'm a Jew. You get to go into that space. And then there's an extra space that the Jews were able to go into. But then they would receive a do not enter sign. And then if you're a Jew, but you're not a priest, you could go no further. But if you are a priest, you can take another step. There's a different room that you had access to a little bit closer to the manifest presence of God that existed behind the curtain. But if you're not that one high priest, you can go no further. So maybe you're a Gentile and you stop there. Maybe you're a Jew and you have to stop there. Maybe you're a priest and then you stop and go no further. Maybe you're the high priest and you think, cool, I got access to Holy of Holies. I can go into the Holy Holies. Not so fast, high priest. Only once a year and only after you've done all of the right ritual washings, the purifications indicating a symbol, symbolizing your desire to be pure before you enter into the presence of the Lord through that curtain. 
It's a big deal. There are these, and what God is communicating all the time is he's saying, you don't approach me with your jacked up, no good life. You cannot approach me with your sinful condition. I will not be polluted by any amount of sin. That's what God is communicating with the curtain. You won't pollute my presence with your sin. So that's a problem for us because I want to be in the presence of God, but I'm a sinner. So what happened? Christ dies on the cross, and at that moment, the scriptures say the curtain separating the holiest of holy place was ripped in two. And it was ripped in two from the top, not the bottom up, but from the top down, indicating that this is God's work for you on your behalf. This is not your ability to finally get it right that enabled you to enter into the presence of God. That's the gospel. We can enter into the presence of God. And, and it said... Let us draw near, full assurance of faith, heart sprinkled clean. We have boldness to enter into that place. We don't have to be timid. I can imagine that priest once a year, if he hadn't done everything right, I wonder if he just kind of like slowly like poked a little bit of his body through the curtain just to see if there was like a burn sensation on his hand and kind of slowly made his way into the presence of God and the timidity that might have been there, right? But the scriptures just said, you can walk right on in. Just open the doors and walk in. Now, why can we have that kind of boldness? Is it our ability to finally get it right? No, 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 no. Dear friends, it is Jesus' ability who has got it right on your behalf. And if you have submitted yourselves to Jesus, have repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus, then at that moment, his blood covers you. And when God looks at you, he sees the perfection of Jesus. And in that state, you can be allowed into the presence of God with boldness and confidence but let me share with you something else. You get to be the man at the gate inviting others in. How cool is that? You get to say there used to be a do not enter sign. Are you Jew, Gentile? Doesn't matter. Priest, high priest? Doesn't matter. Has Jesus covered your sins? Have you responded in repentance and faith? Welcome. Community church, my hope would be that your church is just a super welcoming church. So many of you greeted me as I was here this morning. You don't know me. You recognize I'm new, um, but you made me feel welcome. And that's an important thing for us to do at the church. And then I just want to, um, I was excited to hear that you guys are going to be doing marriage and parenting and then um, evangelism. Make that a priority, whatever it takes for you to get here on that, that Sunday night, whatever it was, six o'clock. Learn, be confident in a method to share the gospel because you'll be more bold to share the gospel. You get to be the man at the gate welcoming others in. That's the gospel. That is good news. Now, because of that good news, there are three commands that we're going to walk through. We're going to walk through them um, here pretty quickly. The first one is, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So there is a drawing near that we are supposed to do, but we do it, if you notice, together. It says, let us. It doesn't command you individually. It says, hey, church, let's us, all of us together, draw near. Now, the reason I think we need to do this together is because there are times in which I don't want to draw near to God. I don't know if that's real for you, but there are times when I feel like because of my sin, I shouldn't have access to God. He, he's probably upset at me, and I need to give him some time to cool off, and I need to just uh, you know, sit in my room for a couple of days before I can really walk in back into the presence of God. That's a lie from the enemy. He's accusing you. He's, he's trying to convince you that you are not who God says you are in Christ. In Christ. So that moment for me, there's a couple of ditches. I think ditch number one is um, something like, I'm doing really well. I kind of got this thing figured out. I'm crushing this Christian life. I am reading my Bible daily. I'm looking for opportunities to share the gospel with people that I know. Um, I, you know, I'm praying a lot. That's going well. Seems to be, man, I, like God is actually kind of lucky to have me on his team. This is, I'm, this is great. I'm doing really well. And I'm going to boldly enter into the presence of Jesus on my own works, under my own strength. That is a ditch and it's a ditch that most of us in here can kind of laugh at and shrug off and know that's not us because we know we're sinners. But I'm telling you, the majority of the world, this is what they believe. If you ask people, hey, um, what do you think happens when you die? If you believe in heaven and hell and they say yes, do you believe you're going to heaven or hell? I'm going to heaven. Why do you think you're going to heaven? Nine times out of ten, what they'll share with you is I'm, 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 I'm a good person. I've tried really hard to do the right things. I'm better than the closest jerks around me that I know, like the coworkers that cuss a lot more than I am, better than those guys. 
So I'm good. I'm covered because I have, have done it. I've got there. That's ditch number one. That is not the gospel. Okay. Ditch number two might be more where some of us end up from time to time. Ditch number two is I'm, I'll never measure up. God would never want me in his presence. He doesn't want anything to do with me. Why would he? I, I, I know me. I know my thoughts. I know what I don't act on, but what I think, and that's messed up. And God doesn't want me at all. God doesn't want anything to do with me. I just know it. He, there's, there, that's just not, that's not the gospel either. So you've got this gospel error over here. I'm really good and God deserves, uh, and I deserve God. And ditch number two is I could never enter into God's presence no matter what. My sin's too great. What you're saying over here is thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. I still need to do some stuff. It's not enough, your death. It's not enough for me. You hear the pride when you say it that way? I, I got to do some stuff. That's a ditch. So we need each other to draw near because whatever ditch I might be kind of falling over on into, maybe you can grab my hand and yank me back to the middle of the road and say, no, 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 that's a ditch. You're headed towards a ditch. Let us draw near. And this is something we do together. Avoid those ditches. And we can do it with confidence, but we do it together. Um, okay, point number two, together we hold fast to hope. Look at the scriptures. Verse 23, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. Community church, are there times when you find yourself wavering? One of my roles at my church is small groups pastor. I love doing small group. Because hopefully, for small groups going well, some of that mask that normally is there kind of begins to come off as you begin to know people and trust them and build relationships with them. But can I just ask that we do some small group this morning in a church this size? You got a lot of folks in here. This is not a small group. It's not even set up like a small group. It's all just rows of chairs, and you're all staring at me. Not, not my favorite setting. I like it when the chairs are in a circle. That's great. Um, but have you, ever, have you ever had a moment in your life in which um, you've struggled with doubt? Like, does God, is he real? Does he love me? Is he for me? It feels like the events in my life right now aren't matching up with that truth. Anybody in the room? Thanks for the honesty. That was a hard thing. Um, moments when you just get distracted from your true purpose. We're like, I'm, I'm, I'm on mission for Jesus. I'm going to live life as one big, long mission trip, looking for opportunities to share. But then for like two weeks, you kind of wake up and you're like, I haven't even, I've just kind of been distracted and just living for myself or living for any number of reasons, maybe even good things, living for my family, but not living for Jesus. Is that anybody ever distracted? Yeah, me too. Things like that happen. We get entangled in sin, maybe. And there, are, there is a reason that we do church. It's because together we can do things that we wouldn't be able to do apart. I'm sure you've all seen videos um, of like a, a marathon runner running a race. This happened in Chicago this past year. Close to the end of the marathon, this girl faints close to the end. And there were people who came around her at expense of their own time. You know, you're running a marathon, you want a good time. They stopped, they helped her up, they put their shoulders under her, and they finished the race with her. That's what we do with each other as the church. We help each other. When people are struggling, wavering, not, don't know if they're going to make it, uh, we yank them and we speak truth into their lives. And that's something we got to do. This happened for me back when I was in high school. Um, years ago, I used to mountain bike a lot more than I do now, and I um, found this one spot that I really enjoyed. There's like a waterfall. From time to time, I would just sit down there and enjoy some time um, with the Lord. There had been a season in my life in which I was dry and distant, and there was some static in that communication line, um, and it just, I just felt weak. I felt, uh, I felt far from God, like we hadn't really talked in a while, and I was praying really lame prayers. Um, just kind of the ones I know from memory, uh, you know, at the dinner table, things like that, but not, not really praying with the Lord. And um, I knew I needed to do something. So uh, I got my camel back on, filled it with water, put my Bible in the camel back, rode down to my favorite spot, hung out at that waterfall, opened my Bible, read for a while, and then I just prayed a really short prayer, something like, God, speak. Would you speak to me? Just speak to me, please. Father, would you speak to me? And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and I got nothing, y'all. 
I got silence. And I was confused. I was wavering. I was doubting. But I wasn't alone. So I go back home, talking to my friends. There was a good friend that I had at the time. And I said, man, I don't understand. You got to help me with this. I have been distant from God. I have not been. By the way, anytime you're distant from God, it's you running from him. He's not retreating from you. In fact, when you run from him, he just kind of follows you along the way so that in that moment of repentance, he's able to meet you right there. He's not tapping his foot. Figure it out, crawl on back. That's not the gospel. God is waiting for that moment for you to return, right? So the distance was my distance. I had gone silent. I had gone weak. I had all that, all that was me. Went down, prayed, didn't hear a word, came back, talked to my friend. I said, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Can you help me with this moment? Um, I got nothing from the Lord. I like asked him to speak to me and he didn't speak. What's up with that? And he said, Tyler, my wife's over here. Uh, he said, Tyler, imagine, I wasn't married at the time, but imagine you were married. Imagine um, that you just had kind of walked by your wife in the house for like two months just not spoken to her at all, cold shoulder, but like no reason why, just kind of apathetic. She comes home from work, you don't say a word. You come home, you don't say a word. You just eat dinner quietly. He says, do you think that you could come home from work one day and walk into your house and go, hey, I got like 30 minutes, um, speak. You think your wife wants to respond to you in that moment? She does not. You don't ask God to conform to your schedule. You're on his schedule. And you had been distant from the Lord, and you said, hey, I got some time. Why don't you speak to me now? As if you slot him in a spot on a Tuesday. I got lunch open. It's not the way our God works. That word was a, a strong rebuke that I needed. I needed that that morning, whatever it was, that afternoon. Um, it hurt a little bit. It stung, but he was absolutely right. And it yanked me back into reality and stopped me from doubting, from wavering. I needed that moment. I needed that community. Um, so this holding fast is a command to abide. I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, not me, Jesus <laughs> is, is saying those words. I am the vine, you are the branches, abide in me. There's, there's one vine, but there's many branches. And we abide together. Community church, you're living up well to your name when you abide together and you're hearing each other's burdens and you're reminding each other of God's promises. And my hope is, is that you're doing community well enough to know what each other's burdens are. You can't depend on physical proximity to, to do that. It's gonna have to be more intentional than just that, right? Um, hearing burdens, reminding of promises, things like, things like um, you know, when a couple is, is grieving a miscarriage, it's very helpful when somebody in the community of faith can come alongside them and say, hey, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. He's for you. He's not forgotten you. Someone experiencing a chronic illness, it's helpful to be reminded that the outer man is wasting away. The inner man is being renewed day by day. A couple of months ago, I got to sit in a small group and hang out with some folks. I did not know this when I visited this small group. Um, but I sit in the small group, 10, 15 minutes in, I'm learning that two women in that group had just been diagnosed with cancer. And this is the first group they've attended since that diagnosis. And that clarifies the focus, doesn't it? Really easy to think about what really matters and what doesn't matter when you receive that kind of news. So I'm sitting there in this group and I'm just listening and there were tears, but there was hope. There was the fear of the valley of the shadow of death, but there was faith in God's goodness, in his plan, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Together, we can hold fast to hope. I'm not able to hold fast as well on my own as when I'm having other people help me hold fast. Okay, that's number two. Number three, together, we stir one another up, or we spur one another on, or we provoke. I really like that word, provoke. That's not a word you think should happen in church very much, right? I went to church this morning and I got provoked. Pro I don't know how that went. Like I was provoked with flip-flops on the worship guy. What's up with that? It's not the kind of provoking we're talking about. I shouldn't have provoked you. God cares about the heart, right? So, so what does this mean? What is this stirring, on, stirring up, spurring on, provoking? Well, there are times in your walk when you stagnate. When you... Uh, just kind of go through life and exist and are just kind of treading water, really not making progress anywhere. Um, 
one of my favorite translations for this is spur on. Does anybody's Bible have spur, spur on? Okay, good, awesome, great. Um, so I'm from Texas. You would think that that means that like I know how to ride a horse or that, you know, like we ride them up to the Whataburger uh, drive through and I think that might have happened. It wasn't me. It wasn't my experience. I like drove a hatchback, worked in an office, normal. I just, I'm not a cowboy. These are even fake boots. I don't want to lie to you all this morning. See, they're not full boots. I just lost like 10 people right there. Oh, I thought he had boots on. <laughs> this guy. So I'm not a cowboy. But from what I understand, when you are a cowboy, like a real legit cowboy, you wear spurs. Well, why do you wear spurs? Because from time to time when you're riding your horse, you need to, is that, there we go, you need to jab something in their side to get them going. That's what the scriptures just told us to do. There are times in which you got to stir somebody else up or when you got to spur them on because they're just kind of stagnating, not living on purpose, on mission, or they're wavering. So that's something that we do and we have to do that together. You can't do that alone. I can't spur you on if I'm not in community with you, right? Spurs don't feel good. The horse does not enjoy that moment, I have to imagine. But there is a time when your community needs to get you going again. It's a good thing, and we should appreciate that moment. I'll also tell you, not every spur is invited, it's helpful when you can say to somebody else, hey, I'm really struggling with a thing. Can you help me? Um, that's me inviting the spur, right? That's what my friend did for me. That's, that's different um, from what I'm talking about now, which is a blind spot. All of us in the room have blind spots. Areas of sin that you really don't even notice because you've just been baked in it so long. Um, or just ways that you are. So early on in our marriage, um, I, I grew up with a mom and a sister who were extremely type A personality, and we just spoke really harshly to each other all the time, and it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't right, but that was the way I grew up. And so I thought that's the way you communicate. You just say it harshly, you say it quick, get it over with, and then maybe you apologize, maybe you don't. But you move on it, you move past it, it's not a thing. And then I marry like this tender rose of a wife and I'm just like speaking to her like this, wagging that rose around, you know, just speaking to her any old way, thinking this is what's, you know, this is how we do marriage, right? And just tell you what I think. And, uh, you know, just crushed her, absolutely crushed her. And I'm like, what is your problem? Why are you crying? Get over it. You know, I didn't, I was a long time, had some learning to do in that arena in my life. Um, praise the Lord. I think she would testify to you that I'm somewhere along that path, haven't arrived, <laughs> heading that way. Um, but it's a blind spot. And the thing about blind spots is, I'm going to blow your mind, you can't see them. You don't know that you have them. You might be a prideful person and nobody is telling you, hey, you, you might have a pride issue because you're too prideful to hear it. You might just invite that from somebody who knows you really well this week, a spouse, a close friend, somebody who you know will speak truth to you. Hey, do you see any blind spots in my life that you just are looking for an opportunity to make me aware of? I'd love for you to just use that opportunity right now. I'm open. That's a, that's a scary question to ask, but it's an important question to ask. But sometimes that blind spot's not invited. I was reminded of uh, David and Nathan, you know, after David's sin with Bathsheba. And David, Nathan comes to David and he says, hey, imagine a rich man and a poor man. And imagine a traveler is coming and this rich man has all this sheep but he doesn't kill any of his sheep to, to make a feast for the, for the traveler. He takes the poor man's one single sheep, kills it, makes a meal for the traveler. What should happen to that kind of guy? Nathan says this to David. And you would think if David had any kind of spiritual sensitivity in the moment at all, he'd be like, oh yeah, you're talking about me. He, it, didn't, it, didn't bring, it didn't come to his mind. He was blind. Nathan says, what should happen to that man? And David says, you should kill that man. That man should die. And Nathan said, that man is you. Nathan was making David aware of a significant blind spot, completely blind to it. Told him a parable, didn't get that it was about him. Kill that man, that man is you. Nathan confronts David in that moment, in his blind spot. Now, relationships are key to that moment. If I were to come to you this morning and say I noticed somebody speeding along the way to get here on time or something like that, I would not come to you and say, hey, I saw, I saw you and you need to cut that out. 
I, you don't, I don't have a relationship with you. Pro, you might even feel that right now. As I'm standing up here preaching, 99% of the room doesn't know me before I walked in this morning. You might be going, I don't know that guy. I don't, why would I listen to him? And, and part of you is right to think that. You should, be, you should be comparing what I say with what this says. And if I'm not lining up, you go with this, right? You should be doing that. But the more we spend time together, the more relationship we have together, there should be a bond and a trust that develops and a foundation of love in which I can say the hard thing. So what I'm saying, community church, is build community for that moment. Build community, establish relationships that are so deep that after that moment, you know that person still loves you. They just wanted to confront you in love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse the kisses of an enemy. A good friend, a faithful friend, will wound you from time to time because they love you. Pursue friendships like that. Be that kind of person. Be a friend like Nathan, right? Um, and do you have a level of humility to hear the hard thing? Maybe you don't need to be the spur. Maybe you're the one that's getting spurred. And just be ready for those moments. Have enough humility to hear and consider and um, think through and evaluate. It might look something like this. Hey, uh, man, I love you. You know that. And I reserve the right to be wrong here. But I see, I think I see, a blind spot that I'd love to make you aware of and just allow you to consider. I did this last week in my own small group. I said, hey, I'm not saying this is the case, but I'm saying there's a possibility out there that you and your wife aren't unified in this decision. And it's a big decision. And you better be asking your wife, do you really agree with me or are you just going along for the moment because if that's the case, there's going to come a day when she resents you for this thing. Be aligned on the big, big decisions. Because you don't want to have a resentful wife in your house five years from now. So I, we, we had to do this. We did this. And it was important that we do. And when you do that, anchor it in Scripture. You're not the authority. Scripture is. Um, but it's an important thing that we do, right? But all of those things are only possible if we're obeying the command to gather together to be honest with one another, to live with one another in fellowship and in uh, truth, right? So, so like I said earlier, together, uh, there were apparently already, like, I don't know when Hebrews was written exactly, but we're not talking hundreds of years after Christ uh, rises from the grave. We're talking like a decade or two. And already people are like, and yeah, you know, I went to church for a while, but I'm going to, you know, just kind of, kind of, I'll make it if I make it. If I don't, that's okay. Already kind of had that habit built in. And he's like, no, don't have that habit. Make it, make it just a non-negotiable. You're going to gather with the believers to stir up, to spur on, to encourage each other, to hold fast, to do true fellowship. Fellowship is a buzzword in the Christian circles. I love the word fellowship. True fellowship is not eating chips and watching the playoff game, watching the Cowboys lose. True fellowship happens when you show your cards. So if we're hanging out together and I've got my cards, the facts about my life, what's going on, my hopes, my fears, my struggles, my pain, my sin, if I'm holding these close to the chest, we can't do true fellowship like this. This is not how true fellowship happens. How does true fellowship happen? I'm going to start to do this. Hey, I got some things I want to tell you about. I got some issues in my life that I've been kind of hiding and I want to bring them into the light. Um, I've got some ways that I am towards my wife that I don't want to be, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to change. Um, I've, I've got some frustrations with parenting, and I think I'm pretty selfish, and, and I just want you to know that. This is what lo true fellowship looks like. Almost. How many of you right now are in the room going, turn over that last card, bro? Do you not know that you have one more? A lot of us live our lives like this. We'll share enough but there's more. This is true fellowship. It's that last card. And maybe you have really great relationships in this church. Maybe you have people that you really know well and you think really know you well. But in the back of your mind, you're aware they don't really know you because you've got one card. Still like that, right? The problem with that is, there's a lot of problems with it. One of the problems is You'll struggle to feel truly loved because you know that you're not truly known. You'll go, they love me, but they don't really know me. If they really knew me, they wouldn't love me. That's a lie. The enemy will convince you and you will believe it because you're not saying, hey, here's my cards. Here's me. 
and then receive the love of the community of faith in that moment and receive the grace of the community of faith in that moment. And that should be what occurs in that moment. When confession happens, man, there should be just a, a swooping in of grace and a flanking on all sides as we walk with you through this thing that you just shared. But we're gonna walk with you and we're not against you. We're not judging you. That should be what happens in that moment. But you gotta be vulnerable. You gotta be honest, open, transparent. Remove the mask. That's true fellowship. So this kind of vulnerability, this kind of honesty, it's not going to happen if you like make it here right before the first beat of the first song. And if you scoot out right as we say, amen, linger, just hang out and, and, and look around the room. And I bet, I think I might've sat in somebody's normal spot this week. I didn't know where to sit earlier on. I was like, I'm going to sit here. Is that okay? Like, do people normally sit there? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try over here. Truth is no matter where I sit, I'd probably be disrupting somebody. Praise the Lord. Uh, sorry. If that was you. Uh, be willing to sit in other places throughout the, the weeks that you come here and just get to know folks that aren't in your normal little section. If you just can't do that and you're anchored where you're anchored and I like seeing the pastor from the left side or whatever, cool. Get to know really well that folks, those folks right around you. Just ask them, ask them that one extra question that you haven't quite asked yet. Hey, how was your week? Really? How's your walk this week? Really? How's your marriage? What's the Lord teaching you? What are you reading in the scriptures? How's he growing you? How's he molding you? Ask those kinds of questions. Build that community. I think it's so vital that we do this because there is a day approaching. I want to take you to one scripture really quick and then we're done. Uh, it's Revelation 21.3 and it says this. Uh, I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling place is with humanity. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. That's a day approaching that I get excited about. We're not there yet, but we want to live in light of that day. That's what I want my focus to be on. That's what I want to direct my steps towards. Not what I'm going to have for lunch today, not what's going to be next week, what does the schedule look like, but there is a day approaching what does it look like for me to be better prepared than I am right now? It takes vulnerability, it takes relationship, draw near to the power of the gospel together. Together, hold fast to hope, community church. And together, be willing to stir one another up, to spur one another on, to encourage, to provoke, do it in an atmosphere of love. It takes relationship, it takes community, it takes the church. Thank you for letting me share with you this morning from God's word. I'd love to pray for you as we close today. Father, thank you for Community Church and the work that is happening here and the work that is going to be happening in Kalamazoo next week. And, and Father, by faith, we believe Michiana and the rest of the world. Um, I'm thankful to have a, a partner church close to home that is loving you and serving you and preaching your word and believing the gospel and trying to get it into people who don't know it yet. Father, I pray that you would embolden this group of believers to ask that next question, to continue to build this community, to pursue community if they haven't yet, if they've just been um, kind of coming and remaining anonymous and going home. Father, I pray that you would encourage us to take that next step. Help us be bold. And thank you that we can enter into your presence with confidence, not because of our ability to behave, but because of your righteousness and your blood that covers our sin. Pray all these things through Christ. Amen. Thank you, guys. Have a good one.